Welcome to the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, where there's always another secret. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to episode 57 of the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies. Today is May 18th, 2020. I'm Bill, and I am joined, as always, by my luminous co-hosts, Amy and Jordan. Hello. Hello. Can we can't. I, can you hear did me? Did you not hear me again? Well, I no, I you. can hear you. <laughs> anyway. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, I can hear you now. <laughs> We're doing Good. great. We are rocking this thing. Before we do get actually started into the podcast proper, we do want to remind you that the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies is not a spoiler-free podcast. If there is something in the Cosmere you haven't read and are worried about hearing spoilers for, you might want to go read those first. Come back and join the discussion because it's a great discussion and the books are worth reading. So just, just trust us on this. In tonight's episode, we are going to be tearing into the gemstone archive of Yurathiru to see what we can glean from the words of those who came before. For those of you who listen to the podcast recordings or watch the videos on YouTube, we do want to remind you that it's possible for our listeners to interact with us live via chat as we record each episode at www.twitch.tv slash table. We record episodes every other Monday night, starting at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern. So please join us, take an active part of the discussion, have fun, enjoy chat, enjoy each other's company, enjoy life. Just come do it with us. Because we like you. Yes. Now, the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies is made possible by the support of our listeners and patrons. The show, of course, will continue to be free, but if you want to help us out, head on over to patreon.com slash Cosmere Studies. Even pledging a buck or two per episode really helps us out as we work to improve the show. Patrons will get immediate access to our Discord channel where you can talk about the show and the Cosmere with other listeners. It's an awesome community, lots of great discussions, lots of great people. And you'll also get early access to bonus episodes, exclusive access to other bonus content, and other good stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, when we can, we like to take a moment to, to say hi to new patrons. And this week, we want to thank the law firm of Laserbeam Monstrosity and Landown owner Calrissian. I don't believe that's what's on their birth certificate. <laughs> what but I don't awesome. like is the fact that this is where we're starting the stream. This is the highlight. <laughs> <laughs> How are we supposed to top the law firm of Laserbeam Monstrosity and Landowner Calrissian? It's awesome. I just, it's a step ahead. <laughs> I, I just, what type yeah. of law do they practice? <laughs> Laser beam. Uh, laser beam monstrosity. Monstrosity. Come on. And land- landowner Cal- Calrissian. Clearly. Come I on. Just... Get with the program. Like my screen anyway, is just uh... splice. <laughs> <laughs> True, but you have all sorts of splicicle. Yeah, but and stuff, this so is. You got... Some people are just better at life than I am. This is what <laughs> this name confirms. Anyway, thank you very much for being a patron, and thanks also to all of our other patrons. You really help us mm-hmm. keep the the show going and hopefully improving. So um, now again, tonight we're talking about the gemstone archive from your Thiru, the one that's down in the room with all the drawers on the walls and has all the, the gems that they listen to and are able to get the records from. But we're, ac- we're actually going to have Jordan take the lead tonight. So uh, I'll just turn the time over to him. Yes. Okay. So I, uh, I became obsessed with this on what is effectively like the fourth read through of Oathbringer. Before this podcast, I'd only read Oathbringer twice. Um, and then <laughs> when we started having to do it for the actual episode of Oathbringer, reread it. But it took us a while to get through Oathbringer, uh, for yeah. those of you who were following along live. <laughs> and well, it so, was only seven episodes. Yeah, so by the time I finished Oathbringer, I was sort of like, man. I got to catch up on the things I forgot about because I read so much. And then by that point, I basically reread Oathbringer again and 
Oh, man. Then we had to start over again. I'm like, oh, I need to brush up on this. And then I basically read, like, the last part of Oathbringer again. So... So say we and, all. Well, and I was just disappointed that one of the things I didn't notice is that when we got to the the interludes that had the gemstone archive, for those who don't remember, this was the uh, uh, Renarin exposed all the the wall and like somehow popped out all the little drawers little that they were in. Mm-hmm. Right. And you, I still don't quite understand how he did that with his powers, but he well, found the truth. So there you go. Either that or it has something to do with the fact that uh, Gliss is corrupted. Could be. Mm. I forget. It's light. But would they, but light, would, but would they uh, have wanted a corrupted spren to find it versus a normal spren? It's light weaving. What? And what's the other one? Light weaving and healing. Healing. Yeah, it's yeah. just the, the old, It has to be a resonance thing that. Mm. Could be, yeah. Uh, I don't know. It just. That's what makes sense to me. Anyway, what I didn't notice was like I read them I'm like oh this is very interesting and what I didn't notice was the fact that they were different gemstones and I you know it's stupid me I was like wait a minute I bet the gemstones correspond to the orders of knights and mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm just like Ugh. just not noticing important details like that and so ever since then I've been obsessed with I've always wanted to do an episode where we look at each one sort of grouped by their orders and see what we can glean because some of the orders we don't know much about Mm. So, um, I sort All of right. went in a specific order. The first order I wanted to start with was the Edge Dancers. They, uh, their gemstone is diamond, and there's not a single one for the Edge Dancers. Really? Yes, not yeah. one. Um, but when we go to the Stone Wardens, who are Topaz, the first one reads, The Edge Dancers are too busy relocating the tower servants and farmers to send a representative to record their thoughts in these gemstones. I'll do it for them, then. They are the ones who will be most displaced by this decision. The Radiance will be taken in by nations. But what of all these people now without homes? Which makes it sound like the Edge Dancers are homeless. But makes sense if they're just traveling uh, wanderers who just go around helping out people for those who have been forgotten. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know, just, I mean could could he also just be meaning that all the people that they're trying to move to new places could be instead and instead that's of the dancers. Well, and what I was thinking is the radiance will be taken in by nations, but what of all these people now without homes? What if that's the people that the radiant that the edge dancers are trying to remember? Yeah. You know, yeah. suddenly you have all these people who are forgotten and suddenly that's a big weight on the edge dancers. You know, I mean, that's their role, and suddenly, just everybody. They have to find homes for them and, mm-hmm. and find places for them to be. Well, one of the other things want to make that, sure they're not forgotten. it made me think about was just the fact that edge dancers would be amazingly good at helping you move, given uh-huh. that oh, they can yeah. make things frictionless. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> think that about that piano nice. you got to move, and it's just like, what? no sweat. And then, like, it goes down this. the hill. Like, oh. I just imagine they're all lift. And it's just like, it just starts going down the hill out of control. <laughs> and then smashes into some wall. And she's just like, I'm helping. See? It's great. Yep. No. Well, Not I mean, that people you imagine, in ancient times had pianos. Well, and that's the thing is that you look at ancient times. I was thinking the building of the pyramids and how they had these slopes that they were pushing things up. Well, with an edge dancer, there's no mm-hmm. friction, just which could be good and could be bad. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you have to slow it down. You need to get some momentum going up. at some point. <laughs> right. <laughs> so probably not lift, but... More mature lift. I, I just found I it interesting that ex- the Edge Dancers didn't send a single person. They're too busy. They're, they're too busy doing Because they were too good. busy relocating. Yeah. Well, it's also, yeah. if you think about their O's, they don't care much about history. That's not, that's not their thing. They're more Except about helping those over. who are here. They're in the Except now. that their oath is remembering those who have been forgotten. Yes, so. but that, like that, you could take it as a more broad like thing there. But it, I just don't like everything we've seen and recorded about the Edge Dancers. They seem more about the world that is, mm-hmm. and I don't perhaps because the the histories and stuff seems to be more the Elts callers. True. Yeah. And so. At least with with Yasna as our example. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. the other thing that's interesting is the fact that the Stone Wards are the ones who record it for the Edge Dancers. We don't know much about them. The only one we really know about is Tal and Ellie Lynn. Right. And 
he's and he's technically not a stone warden himself. He's the the patron herald of them. Yeah, we do know that they're uh, the. Oh dang it! Where was it? I had it in a thing around here. Anyway, their whole thing was they protect people and they're resolute. And you think about Talonelli Lynn and what he went through holding the oath pact by himself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so if you assume that that's a trait that tends to generally ascribe to the rest of the Stone Wardens, it makes mm-hmm. a lot of, a lot of these next lines make sense. Right. So the next one, the enemy makes another push towards Feverstone Keep. I wish we knew what it was that they had them so interested in that area. Could they be intent on capturing Ral Elorim? Does that name ring a bell? I had to look it up. <laughs> Because I could not I'm remember. having trouble. Raoul Elorim, I forgot this as well. This is where uh, Lyft is actually from. This is her hometown. We don't know much about it. So I'm just going to read oh, from the okay. copper mind. I didn't realize well, that. The, well, the other thing is that Feverstone Keep is what, where one of Dalinar's yes. um, His visions, visions was. Is from, yeah. So Raoul Elorim is a city in the mountains of northern Erie on Roshar and the most populous city of that nation. It is also known as the City of Shadows for cryptic reasons. That was something uh, Mm -hmm. lit. we find out from Lyft's interlude in Way of Kings. Um, And it contains an oath gate. Mm -hmm. (gasps) That's right. That's the part I saw. And so we don't know much about it. Um, We know that they have it it under their control right now in the Oathbringer storyline. But just the fact that that Lyft has the offhand line of calling it the City of Shadows... Hmm. wondering hmm. just what that means and if that's metaphorical in nature, but the fact that Brandon puts it in an interlude tells you that at some point it's we're going to be going back to Rala Lorim. Hmm. Which I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next one I think also uh, is interesting and it starts to get more towards what it is the stone wards are. H- hang on a sec. So Ral El Arim is where Lyft is from? Uh, yeah, Lyft grew up in Ral El Arim and recalled terrible memories of her time there. That's all it says in the copper mine. Okay, so... Because Lyft is referred to as a, as a Reshi girl. Yes. But her but, mom, her mom moved. Yeah, her okay, mom is the so, one who told... She so wouldn't she, know she was Reshi if... Uh, so she's Reshi by heritage. She's Reshi by heritage, mm-hmm. but she grew up in Ral El Arim. Okay. And yeah. I don't know that she had... She doesn't have any memories of her father, I'm guessing, right? It's... We, not that we've seen. She hasn't yeah. mentioned him. But with her, who yeah. knows? Because we knows also if, have if... a standing uh, pro- oath that she's made. Not oath, but bond that she's made with the uh, the Night Watcher. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, as so far we as we know, know she... Cultivation, maybe. Mm-hmm. I, th- I can't remember. I, I feel like she may have spoken to Cultivation, but I, I don't recall. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember it offhand either. So, the, so this is the next one on the Stone Wards. As a Stone Ward, I spent my entire life looking to sacrifice myself. I secretly worry that that is the cowardly way, the easy way out. I think that's an interesting one. It's very um, interesting because we don't know much about them, but we go back to Talonelli Lynn. What did he do? He sacrificed himself. But the, But the thing is... Well, part of it is, as a stone ward, I spent my entire life looking to sacrifice myself. Now, in a lot of people's mind, sacrificing yourself means dying for something. Mm-hmm. Um, I've heard a saying, I can't remember if it was in a book or a movie or what, but somebody says, I would die for this, you know, for this cause. And somebody else says, live for it instead. Be- and well, I, I can see in a sense that if you die for it, it's a one Action it's over. One, you're it's done. over. You're done. But if you keep living for it and keep working at it, then that is more effort. Not that dying mm-hmm. is easy to do either. But if you continue doing it, then mm-hmm. it is harder to keep it up, especially with like getting tired or it gets harder or all these other things that factor into persistence and endurance. Exactly. It's, so that's kind so of the feeling I got from this quote was that. It's also interesting just because the Stone Wards, uh, the only time we really get to see one in action, we see them in one of uh, the, the visions. And right. he's making steps out of, the, out of the stone where he's sort of drawing the stone out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it just talks, it just sounds, it's, 
it's a very knightly image like of we haven't seen very much as far as you know they're called the knights radiant but the stone wards seem to be the most knightly of them and the i it's hmm. it's it's hearkening back to a very uh oh what's the word for like arthurian oh chivalry yes it's, it, it recalls the, shiv- the whole idea i thought you know i was i would spend my life looking to sacrifice myself it sounds very arthurian to me that there's some okay. story about you know some knight that is looking you know to die for some cause and could you know it's, that maybe he's too strong that he, he never dies for a cause and he doesn't know what to do it just sounds like an mm-hmm. arthurian problem to me yeah. Basically sacrificing your will, but that means you don't have to make any decisions. Yeah. Okay. Which gets to the whole thing with Odium. Give me your pain. This is also another right. trying to not have to think things through. It's also it also reminds me of uh of Princess Bride. With the you know, he finally kills the six finger man and now he doesn't know what to do with his life. It's sort of that yeah. in reverse. Yeah, basically mm-hmm. you're you're giving up any uh Oh, what's the word? Accountability as well. Mm. Then the last one I find very interesting because of what mm. their powers are. He says, The disagreements between the Skybreakers and the Windrunners have grown to tragic levels. I plead with any who hear this to recognize you are not so different as you think. Mm. Their power, they have two surges. The, the mm-hmm. co- surge of cohesion, which is also known as the surge of strong axial interconnection. And tension, the surge of soft axial interconnection. So mm-hmm. both of their surges deal with connecting things. And what do we see here? He's worried about disunity. Mm. Um, yeah. Well, it's and it just if you think about the skybreakers and, the, and windrunners, the the two main ones we see main skybreaker. Well, first main skybreaker is nailed, but. Zeth. Yep. So you know And more. Yeah. main Windrunner is Kaladin. Yeah. And we've seen clashes between... That's one of the first sort of comparisons we've made. It, because, you know, first off, we first saw Zeth using um, Jezrean's Honor Blade. Mm-hmm. And so the, it, you're immediately going to draw a comparison between Kaladin and Zeth. It's just... It's built into it because they are foils of each other. Mm-hmm. And so seeing that there's been disagreements between those two orders from back in the days of the, the actual Knights Radiant, it's it's an interesting concept. But then he says, I plead with any who hear this to recognize you are not so different as you think. Again, we compare them because of their similarities. Well, and then we notice the comparison because of the differences. But first, the similarities have to be there for the differences to matter. And what's interesting, I think, is there's so much of a focus in, for Kaladin of doing what is right. And mm-hmm. this is a huge tension point for him because he is now starting to see the world from so many different perspectives that he can't figure out what is the right thing to do. Right. Compare that to the, the Skybreakers who they also want to do what is right. But theirs is the assumption that you can never know what is actually right like uh, with a capital r Mm -hmm. and so we will we will you know you will accept an approximation you'll accept the fact that you are limited and you can do things but there's at some point there's going to be a tension between those two ideals i still my my gut tells me the tension's going to come when they find out that uh, adolin killed sadius and there's mm-hmm. going to be uh, a problem between what does the law say is right and what was right. Yeah. To be fair, Zeth has sworn himself to follow Dalinar himself. And I to- can see, does, does Dalinar know yet? I know Dalinar, Dalinar just knows. found out at the end of, end of Oathbringer. Oh, and we didn't really see his reaction much. No, we, we saw it because we, we don't know oh, yeah. what he'll do with it because he told Adolin he's going to be king. And yeah, Adolin's just like, uh, like no, 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 I am not. <laughs> I am not king we, material. That's right. I killed right. Sadius, and Dalinar's. which is why Yesna is queen or yeah. king. Or, yeah, Yesna. <laughs> and it's just one of those things. You're just like, oh, that. Well, especially now we Ooh. know that the oh, I forget the Dustbringer uh, lady's name. Oh, what is her name? But um, we know that she's been I, using her spren to spy on them. Yeah, I can't remember her name. Yeah, I have to look it up. 
So, if her spren heard that juicy morsel, oh man, there could That's be some true. fun. Um, so since we ended on that with the stone warden, stone wardens had it's, four. Uh, it's Malata. Malata is her Malata. name. Malata. That's right. And Spark is her. Spren. Which, when she was first introduced and her name began M A L, I'm just like, oh, she's gonna be bad. <laughs> mm, Mal, yeah. Uh, Why? So, because Brandon does that. He does. <laughs> So I thought we'd go to the Windrunners and the Skybreakers notes after that. Mm-hmm. Okay. The first one's just very Kaladin. Today yeah. <laughs> I leapt from the tower for the last time. I felt the wind dance around me as I fell all the way along the eastern side, past the tower, into the foothills below. I'm going to miss that. Yeah. It's it feels like right the Windrunners really do have not only... Are, is protecting their drive, but they seem to be one of the more, not melancholy, but uh, emotional. Very groups. introspective. Tur- turbulent, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, introspective turbulent. is a good. And they they think a lot of, well, because they're so focused on doing what is right and protecting people that that lends itself to introspection, which leads to, my spren claims that that recording this will be good for me. So here I go. Everyone says I will swear the fourth ideal soon, and in so doing, earn my armor. I simply don't think I can. Am I not supposed to want to help people? Mm. Speculation! Yes. Oh, that right there. Let's just start up all of the fan <laughs> theories. So clearly, at least for the Windrunners, the fourth ideal will give them their armor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the, and the fourth ideal is the one that Kaladin could not swear. Yes. Which, and he says, am I not supposed to want to help people? And so it leads to the whole thought process of their fourth oath being something around the fact that accepting either that you can't help certain people or that to help people, you're going to have to hurt some others or something like that. Or you got to, or you got to pick your battles or, or save the ones that you can instead of the ones that you want to, or or that are just going to be problems. Which when you think about it, Go back to one of the earliest scenes we see of Kaladin's flashbacks when mm-hmm. Rashon's son is lying yeah. there and his father is next to him, and Kaladin's father has to make a choice. And he picks the dad because he's like because the he couldn't because he couldn't save the son, mm-hmm. and it was just it was one of the defining moments in Kaladin's life. Yeah, and it is also one of the moments that fully set Rashon against Liren. Mm-hmm. Which and led so to it's, all it, the other events. It's really, really interesting seeing how Liren taught Kaladin a lot of the ideals that led to him becoming or fitting with the Windrunners, while mm. at the same time, um, while at the same time, Kaladin's been pushing against him his entire life as well. Well, it's because he has a lot of the skills of the Windrunners as far as protecting people and saving them and mm-hmm. rescuing them, but Liren is not the um, is not emotionally invested the way the Windrunners are. He's actually a, probably a lot more like a Skybreaker, mm-hmm. where it's it's about what how much good can I do? What's the limit? What's reality? And very rooted in the end net effect rather than the principle behind it. Mm. He's he's much more rational than emotional. I feel like yes and no. I, I, I can't really get into it right now because I haven't thought it through. I don't know that I agree with you on that. I'm willing to be convinced, but we'll do that at a later time. No, but, that's yeah. fine. I, I'm, I'm not quite. I'm sold spitballing here too. Kind of. I mean, I might be reading, getting close to the right word, but not quite there too. So, yeah, it's just yeah. it is very interesting that, and and it's what leads me to think that a lot of the orders, their fourth ideal. Like, the first two are sort of building upon whatever... Or the, the second two, I should say. The first one's the generic one, they all say. Right. Um, mm-hmm. But I think the second and third ones are sort of building upon the basic principle of what it is that order's about. And, and I, the fourth is the twist? The, f- the fourth is the twist. Because I'm trying to remember the Skybreaker's order, because we know all their oaths. The, the, the fourth one is, uh, is swearing yourself to a, a crusade. Yeah. Which is interesting because that's different from swearing yourself to uh, a specific law, whether it's a person or a, or a country or something like that. 
It's mm-hmm. well, and that's the thing, and it's it's very active. Yes. Yeah. Whereas the first two are very reactive for the skybreakers. Mm-hmm. And then, exactly. and then the fifth one is insanely active, where you become the law itself, where you're apparently your judge dread. <laughs> Basically, you are comfortable saying, "I can make this call now." Yeah, <clears throat> which, which is interesting. Uh, sets a lot Zeth more Windrunner. Well, it's also the exact opposite of what Zeth did when he was considered truthless. Yeah, you know, he was not allowed to make any decisions for himself. Uh, pet some bonus to uh, Jar Jar where he just says Brandon has some gems in store for us. For sure, pun intended. The, so Skybreakers. Oh dear. Um, Skybreakers are very Skybreaker about this whole thing. First one, mm-hmm. we can record any secret we wish and leave it here. How do I know that they'll be discovered? Well, I don't care. Record that then. <laughs> <laughs> Where it's just it's because uh, it, it is sort of much much more like the edge dancers in this regard in that they're very much concerned with the material world that exists now, not mm-hmm. the possible one. And the and the the rest of these are also uh, deal with the world as it exists at that moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I wish to submit my formal protest at the idea of abandoning the tower. This is an extreme step taken brashly. He's not trying to preserve anything for other people. He is just wanting to let everyone know. This was a bad idea. Mm-hmm. I'm <laughs> going to put down that I didn't like this. Yep. And then the last one is pro- like, still very much the dealing with the present, but may- one of the juicier ones. This generation has had only one bondsmith, and some blame the divisions among us for this fact. The mm. true problem is far deeper. I believe that Honor himself is changing. Which means it was likely the Stormfather's um, Bondsmith. I'm guessing. Well, he says this generation has only had one Bondsmith, and we know there's never more than three. There's one for the Stormfather, right. Cultivation. And that's what I'm saying is I the think sibling. the one Bondsmith that they've had was probably bonded to the Stormfather. It, well, it there probably is, because we know there's not one for the sibling because of things that we'll read later on in these things. But I thought it was it was saying that the sibling had had no the sibling has had him before yeah before but but not at this moment not this time okay i'm pretty sure all right like the 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 thing is the sibling is directly tied to your theory so the fact that they're abandoning Mm. your theory right now would probably probably (laughs) might tie into why they're leaving it something's up with the sibling which we would get into yeah but i think of how for someone like the skybreakers who try to affix themselves to a a north star and -hmm. just stick with Mm -hmm. it Think of how terrifying the concept of honor is changing Mm -hmm. is to that person. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. That would shake everything. And so it's just... I'm interested. I love it. I'm interested to see exactly how this change works. Just because, like, you know, what what change is honor, would honor be going through at this point? Like, we do know he wasn't quite sane at the end. Right. And so is it because of the stuff Odium is doing to him? Is it... Or was Honor dead at this point? Yeah. And they just don't know Because yet. remember, they've been in denial about Honor being dead since the conception of... I mean, basically since the entire time. Like, mm-hmm. they, they just didn't believe it. And so... So then the next the, one... The, uh, wait, 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 wait. wait. Oh. No, so the other thing that I've noticed about the Skybreakers uh, gemstones, which was interesting, is every single one of them is critical. Yes. Critical of mm-hmm. something different. So the first one is just, I don't want to write these records. This is dumb. The second one is, I'm submitting a formal protest about abandoning your theory. This is a bad idea. And the last one is, you know... The, these division, like there's a problem here. There's a deeper. Now the last one feels a lot more, um, thoughtful and kind of logical. And the other two are kind of emotional. The first one's almost whiny, and <laughs> but this one feels a bit more of a mature look at it. And he's just like, guys, listen. This is, you know, th- there's a deeper problem. Mm-hmm. And so it's it's interesting seeing different 
mindsets from a skybreaker's perceptive perception. Yeah. And yeah, it's also interesting just because the skybreakers are the ones we now know are fighting for the parchment. Um, Mm -hmm. just Mm -hmm. due to how, how, uh, nail views sort of what his oath is and, you know, had to have a real deep, thoughtful introspection as to what it means. Which is sort of interesting because that's sort of what their O's are trying to remove from them. That you don't need to think about it because you have picked your your principle. Or, you know, whatever that principle is, that's the mm-hmm. one you're going to stick by. And so the fact that that's, this last one is so introspective, it makes me think that whoever wrote this one was probably someone higher up in the Skybreakers. Right. Mm-hmm. Probably someone who, I, I would guess at least of the fourth ideal. Mm-hmm. My, that would be my assumption too and so it's just I don't know it's interesting especially because we know we're getting more Seth stuff not this next book but the the one after so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure we'll still see plenty of Seth just not flashbacks oh yeah uh, the next one was Bondsmith Heliodorus and there's no stones for the Bondsmith which we now know there's only one and so, so he probably was too busy yeah well, especially because of stuff that we're going to get into later. We know they're busy. Mm-hmm. Uh, this next one, I think, is... It's the most surprising to me. When I found... I'm like, okay, Ruby, Ruby, who's Ruby? Dustbringers. So, with Dustbringers, you know, all we have is a mulatto. And so I expected something a lot more biting. These are very thoughtful, sensitive ones here. Mm-hmm. If this is to be permanent, then I wish to leave record of my husband and children. Wismal is a good man as any woman could dream of loving. Kamakra and Molinar are tr- the true gemstones of my life. Then, hmm. this next one I think was the last one. I, I forgot to tell myself what the order of these things were in the book. But the last one is from a Dustbringer. Good night, dear Eurotheru. Good night, sweet sibling. Good night, Radiance. Hmm. These are very thoughtful and almost poetic. The second one feels very poetic, yeah. Um, One thing we do know, we do see Malata making art, and we do know Ash destroys art. Um, And we know she's going to be the Dustbringer perspective we eventually do get. Um, Mm -hmm. But I started thinking about it, why is Malata? What's her big motivation? That they that her her spren were back had were betrayed, right? Well, that's that's Spark. Kind of but, but I Spark, believe but... Malata doesn't like the the natural order of things. She doesn't like this world. Mm-hmm. She is and she's basically an anarchist. Is what it sounds like to me. Yeah, yeah. But anarchists, I, I've met a few. Most of them have been actually very deeply introspective and, th- and thoughtful people. And they That's actually true. do tend to be very kind people on, on an individual level. Um, it's the system they don't trust. And what are these <laughs> things talking about? She, you know, it's the love of a family. It's the love of the city. Good night, sweet sibling. Like, mm-hmm. it's, it's, this is someone who is deeply thoughtful about these things and I'm sort of reminded of the whole thought of you can't hate something without at one point having sort of loved it in some way shape or form Mm -hmm. like the most cruel thing is indifference where you just like "Mm, I just don't care care. yeah apathy right the opposite of love is and hate it's apathy and so it makes me think that this is what we're seeing here is the positive side of the dust bringers What's their main power? It's division. It's the ability to take things away. And I'm reminded of Sezed when he grasps the power of ruin for the very first time. Mm-hmm. And he realizes it's, it's not just entropy. It's not just death and decay and destruction. It's also being at peace with these things. Mm-hmm. It's the acceptance mm-hmm. of it. And so I feel like the Dustbringers might have a little bit of that to them in their ideals. Now, Texas Blade in chat makes a good point. It's actually something I was thinking, too. He says the second one could also be kind of sinister, too, depending on the tone it's set in. Yes. Mm. You know, good night, dear, your ethereal, good night, sweet sibling, good night, radiance. It could be a... I'm going to destroy you. But kind of your tight end fist. Is, is, it's time for you to end. 
I, almost as almost a serial killer feel. Yeah, yeah. I just I yeah. don't it, I don't read it that way. Like I I could see how you could because the, the very vague nature of it being very poetic, the tone would matter a ton, and we're just not going to get mm-hmm. that. You're but, not going to get it through a gemstone, yeah. But it just it strikes. I, Brandon uses the interludes a lot of times to either foreshadow something that is coming immediately, the one that. Cal or one something that just happened when Cal I think the one for Kaladin where he can't swear the fourth ideal I think that was either shortly before or after Kaladin has issues swearing the fourth ideal um so what was the 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 wind runner one about how oh. swearing the fourth ideal I think it was and Brandon does tie those loosely yeah like there are definite connections there but the rest made. of them tend to be deeply foreshadowing with details that we can't get and i feel like this is the by putting pairing these two it just comes across to me like he's trying to counterpoint the only other point we've seen which is mulata mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. also in, in relation to that jarosaurus makes a in chat makes a good point there will be more dust bringers in rhythm of war brandon has specifically oh said really that Yes. They just oh. put up the word of Brandon. I haven't read it yet, but. Yeah. Okay. So so we're going to learn more about him, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I am worried because Malata is our current example that it is not necessarily going to be a good thing. Maybe yeah. not. Maybe not. Like, I, I don't want to dislike the Dustbringers, but since she's the only example, it's kind of hard to, to like mm-hmm. much about them. Well, particularly when you look at their surges, because their surges are basically Ooh. destruction. They're scary. They're awesome. Well, no, I'm, not, <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's not the I'm case, absolutely fascinated scary. and want to learn a lot more. Um, it'll be interesting to start seeing other members of each of the orders that we've become familiar with mm-hmm. showing up. Yeah. Um, you know, for example, there's the uh, speculation that Adolin will become an... Uh, an edge dancer or prob- or possibly some hybrid something else but it'll be interesting to see lift not be the only edge only dancer only one yeah to see you know other else callers we've seen some other light weavers um but you know just it'll be just very interesting to see the the orders grow and differentiate from these individuals mm-hmm. it's it's a- one of because one of like I, I always go back to his portrayal of Sezed, where he shows off Sezed and then constantly tells us Sezed is the exception to the rule, <laughs> and so that we get a lot to understand what Terrace men are. And I actually think he's done a lot of that with the uh, order so far because we don't know anything about what a regular truth watcher is because all we have is Renarin who is he's in a, a weird situation. One. We don't really know mm. what a real skybreaker is as far as like how they interact with their spren because Seth has almost had no interaction with a spren of any kind. His interactions are all with night blood of all things and that's just not a normal relationship. <laughs> well, and the thing mm. is Seth does have a spren, I believe, doesn't he? We see we have seen the the them hovering around him. So he's clearly bonded uh-huh. to something. But So it's it exists, but yeah. We don't almost, know anything about it. I almost it. wonder if it if it doesn't we don't see much of it because Nightblood is there and it's maybe a little intimidated by Nightblood or it Why would you be intimidated be. by the Cosmere puppy? <laughs> Cuz it's so cute. Um, the Eldritch puppy. Eldritch. I have the Cosmere puppy. She's Cosmere so puppy lives in Amy's house. Yes. Um I'm sure if we looked at be... Rosie's soul it would look exactly like that picture <laughs> Hilly unlikely drew of Nightblood. <laughs> Just that ball. hers would, would have, have to a be ball. a Yes. A ball and then we're good. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, Texas Blade says Nightblood is a robo sprint. No, no, that is um is Mbot from Skyward. <laughs> That's true. But yeah, the, anyway. Uh, yeah, it's so. But then on, on top of we look at uh, we know that uh, Malata is a dust bringer, but she's working mm-hmm. for the wrong side. We, we see Kaladin as a wind runner. And he's like, oh, he's the prototypical Windrunner. But then we see some of the other people who are joining him. And one of them's Lo- Lopin. Now, to be fair, <laughs> now I guess Lopin has uh, officially joined the Windrunners. Squires don't always join the order that they're squired to. Yeah. 
So we can, can't make assumptions. Lopen, however, does have a sprint because yes, because he, he taught it. Makes he make for, he, he makes crude gestures <laughs> with multiple arms to make an extra rude gesture it's that he extra. can't wear out. So, come on, Nako. Anyway, oh, so the next one was Elt Callers, their gemstone zircon, um, and all of them might as well have been written by Yasna herself. They all sound. <laughs> I just hear them mm. in that Yasna voice. Very as, as the duly appointed keepers of the perfect gems, we of the Elts Callers have taken the burden of protecting the ruby nicknamed Honor's Drop. Let it be recorded. <laughs> so it let makes it be me written, think of Mandalorian. So let it be done. Oh, it makes me think of I have spoken for Mandalorian. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> the next, these all sort of just run together. My research into the cognitive reflections of Spren at the Tower have been deeply illustrative. Some thought that the sibling had withdrawn from men by intent, but I find counter to that theory. Interesting. It's, we still don't know what the so, sibling is. It's so yeah. scholarly. Yeah. Like, it's just written in that very, very scholarly voice. The wilting like I am of stating plants facts. and the general cooling of the air is disagreeable, yes, but some of the tower's functions remain in place. The increased pressure, for example, persists. But and again, she's just no, or he or she is noticing a difference. It's she, because I swear, Yesna went back in time to write these herself. <laughs> we're we're not having Back to the Future, Yesna. <laughs> I want Back to the Future, Yesna. Except uh, the Delorean's now a chull that somehow opens up at the sides. A chalorian. A ch- <laughs> Ooh, I love it. Oh man, I'm in. Oh, here we go. Who's Doc Brown? Oh gosh. Oh. Hoyd. Yeah, that could be fun. Tall, skinny guy with white hair. White hair is Hoyd. Yeah, yeah. And he's older than he looks. Yeah, he's old too. He's a lot older than he looks. <laughs> the last one. Something is happening to the sibling. I agree this is true, but the division among the Knights Radiance is not to blame. Our perceived worthiness is a separate issue. Which so not only is something happening to Honor, something's happening to the sibling, which again is tied to your theory. Yeah. It's it's interesting that but she does make the the same observation of uh, that the Skybreaker did that it's not it's not our division. There's something else mm-hmm. going on. But I do but right. both do acknowledge the division is in some way a problem. Mm-hmm. Right. And but one's coming at it from the Skybreaker perspective, which is very it is what it is. There's not much we can do about it. Her, she's coming at it from the very scholarly problem, more of like a diplomat. Hmm. What do we do? Well, the other thing is you're looking, they're looking at um, causality. The skybreaker is saying honor is changing. And so things are happening to us and we're dividing. And the else caller says, um, our, our the, like, appa- apparently, is apparently issue. the, the, the theory that's put forth and the else caller is countering is that they're dividing, which is causing the sibling to change. Well, no, no. She's saying so that's it's not a, it. She right. Right. I said, I said, she's saying counter to that. Oh, sorry. But apparently that's the prevailing theory in perhaps within perhaps the else callers. Well, it's probably the, prev- I, I would assume the way it's written in both of them. I, I'd assume it's most the nice radiant. Do think this, but I think that's also, People, humanity in general, we tend to look for cause and effect that, you know, that we can control in some way. And we tend to look for the easier answer. And it takes deep thinking to come up with, well, but what if it's not? And a very scholarly else caller, it makes sense that they would look deeply at it. And a very introspective skybreaker, that also makes sense. Mm Mm-hmm. It's just true. It's but it, the other thing I do love the writing is very scholarly. I mean, there's a reason a lot of our readers when they took that uh, test they ended up as else callers. I know. I was that's so surprised true. they got an else caller. I was like, I did not call that one. Nope. See, that's the one I thought I would get. Instead, I got Truth Watchers, which is the next one, and they have the most of all the ones mm, written. They have a lot in there. Uh, their their stone is emerald, and they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight stones yeah. now some i'm just going to read a huge block together 
Um, cause some, some of them are clearly just part of the same story and then I'll stop. Right. For a moment. First one, something must be done about the remnants of Odium's forces. The Parsh, as they are now called, continue their war with zeal, even without the masters from damnation. A co second one, a coalition has been formed among the scholar radiants. Our goal is to deny the enemy their supply of void light. This will prevent their continuing transformations and give us an edge in combat. Third one. Our revelation is fueled by the theory that the unmade can perhaps be captured like ordinary spren. It would require a special prison. And Malishi. We know Malishi mm -hmm. is their one bondsmith. Right. Which this is also foreshadowing what eventually Dalinar was going to do. Mm -hmm. Ba Otto Mishram has somehow connected with a capital C with the Parsh people, as Odium once did. She provides void light and facilitates forms of power. Our strike team is going to imprison her. We are... See, this is one, two... Fifth one. We are uncertain the effect this will have on the Parsh. At the very least, it should deny them forms of power. Malishi is confident, but Naze daughter Kuzodo warns of unintended side effects. And then the last one of this part I want to bring up. Surely this will bring, at long last, the end to the war that the Heralds promised us. So, if you take a look at the history, this is what was done. I'm fairly certain this is the, one of the stones that, uh, that, uh, what's, but Gavilar had. The black one that he I, showed off that, to... That's, that's my yeah. personal opinion. I know people have put out counter opinions to that, but my personal opinion is that those are gemstones containing like because there are multiple ones yeah but at least one of them mm -hmm. is Ba'ato Mishram which is what freaked um oh, what's her name Eshenai oh Eshenai, Eshenai which yeah. is what freaked her out because they want away from the unmade they do not yeah. want them back well it controls them and the scariest them. thing about that let's say that that's correct and Gavilar is the one who had that stone what we've been fighting so far has been the Parshmen without Ba Auto Mishram, who apparently can supply them void light. True, mm -hmm. but we they do have the Everstorm, which they didn't have yes, before. Yes, but that's my point. Yeah. They waged war without the Everstorm before, mm -hmm. and this they don't have Ba Auto Mishram right now. What happens so if they, they get both. her out? Ooh, scary stuff. It's, I'm reminded yeah. of the line from uh, Big Bang Theory. You mean up until now we've been dealing with happy fun time, Shelton? <laughs> <laughs> no, it'll be very... I mean, to the point where when they imprisoned Ba'ato Mishram, it ended. It essentially ended the war. Well, but it also gets to the thing where, where Naze daughter Kuzoto, clearly a, mm -hmm. a, a Shin... Uh, uh -huh. shin uh, woman very yes it's, it's a shin name uh yeah. warns of unintended side effects and we see what the side effect was that it created slave form mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like you know that's basically a hell on earth yeah mm -hmm. yeah it was kind of a defense mechanism but when you go into a defense mechanism and can't get out that's toxic yeah, yeah. and that's <laughs> kind of what happened so and it was generations of it. So maybe we should have considered Naze daughter Kuzodo. It's I just also just love Shin names. It's just so formal. <laughs> it's the best name ever. Nail Sun God. And you're just like, well, that's awesome. <laughs> so there were two more for the Truth Watchers, though, and they're related. The next one was just simply, I worry about my fellow truth watchers. Mm. And that's all it says. And mm -hmm. then the second one, don't tell anyone. I can't say it. I must whisper. I foresaw this. And which is against. Don't trust um, anyone who claims they know the future. Yeah. But and what other truth watcher have we seen that foresees? Only yeah. one other one that we've seen so far, and that is uh, Renarin. This thing, okay, and so we know there's something up. This thing is with, so cool. First of all, I love every other one. It just says, uh, you know, Topaz, this drawer, top, you know, Emerald, this drawer. This one said from drawer thirty twenty, 
a particularly small emerald. It's extra small. This, uh-huh. the, he had to tell it. He had to record it. He had to say it. But it, he still he it. kind of hid it. And he wanted yep. to make it as hard as possible to find because he make it small. And so, but the thing that's interesting, uh, this, those two right next to one another. I worry about my fellow truth watchers followed up by I foresaw this. What do we see with Renard? We see him foreseeing the future. And mm-hmm. originally, we all think it's all due to his corrupted spren. There's no evidence that these people have corrupted spren. What if we're wrong about that? What if this is something deeper about the truth watchers themselves? Like a residence or could be a resonance, could be a something about as they get to higher ideals. Could be their natural uh like their mathematical nature. Um the because they're scholar. They're the other scholars, uh, along with the Elt scholars. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's just what if we're, yeah, I, we assume it's wrong because it's a corrupted spren and that's what's doing it. What if that's not it? it what if yeah, that's I wonder, like, the easy answer? Well, and that would be, that, that would be very Brandon. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like, I wonder if like their following of patterns, because they're very into patterns and residents and things mm-hmm. like that, helps them look at what has happened and kind of use that to help foresee and like their spren enhances it to seeing the future. Know. Well, and then what's the other thing that we remember about Renarin? When Terra Vangian is making his deal with Odium, Odium is like expanded out the diagram. And in all these things, it's like, oh, wow, look how far he sees. And he's sort of expanding upon the diagram like, oh, this is amazing. You did this without foresight and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. But Terra Vangian notices one place, a black name that is outside of Odium's field of vision. Renar and yep. Colin. Ooh, I forgot. Why that. would Renar and Colin be uh, in his in a blind spot? He can see the future. What happens when two Adium, two Mistborn burn oh, Adium? They start going crazy. That's mm-hmm. a good point. And so, Ooh. this is my like. I think Renar is going to turn out to be the most important person for stopping Odium somehow. That's very possible. Yeah, and. But just the fact that Teravangian does notice this doesn't say it to Odium. Doesn't bring it up. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's because I I don't know what Teravangian's game is, but I'm excited to watch him play it. Oh, it scares me. Because I'm not entirely like so many people are just like, ah, oh, Teravangian, he's the worst. I am not sold that Teravangian is a villain. I just want he may do some villainous like a, things, but I like, don't know. Yeah. I almost wonder if like he's like a triple agent or a double agent or however many levels you can go with that. Oh, he's a, he's a can't be a double double agent though. <laughs> he's he's not even like double or triple. He's like a great rhombicosido decahedron <laughs> agent. Like he's playing in multiple dimensions. <laughs> oh, I the I'm also. Again, I I always say this, and I'm going back. We still haven't seen his day of transcendent empathy. Compassion. Yeah. And I just... Mm -hmm. My gut tells me when he has that, that something special is going to happen. And I'm Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if if Renarin, if Taravangian might end up becoming the bondsmith of the sibling. It's very possible. It's just, it's one of these things that it would strike me as very interesting that the sibling shows up finally on whatever this day of connection is. That It's sort of what wakes uh, him up. And then, hmm. I don't know. It's just, because Brandon likes to deal with certain themes, it would also just be very, very interesting from a narrative perspective of what if Taravangian sort of gets cured of his... Thing, his boon slash curse, <laughs> and uh-huh. he like let's say he becomes a bondsmith, and now he's on team good guy. After all he's done, but mm. all he's done in the name of trying, as far as he can see it, to save the world. Yeah, everyone's yeah. the hero of their own story. Yeah, it, no, I'm. There is so much more to Terry Vinci and than than we know yet. Plus, I just love 
book of the second death drawer. It's such a wonderful <laughs> juxtaposition of of exultant and mundane. I love it. Um, it's interesting. The light weavers, as we move on from the truth watchers, um, they only uh-huh. they're garnet and they only get one. And it very shalon. It sounds like to me. I am worried mm. about the tower's protections failing. If we are not safe from the unmade here, then where? Mm. So. The light weavers, at least the ones we've seen, a lot of them seem to be motivated by some sort of fear. Um, just particularly, just, Shalon is the main one that we've seen. Mm-hmm. Um, Hoyd now is one who. I'm, I'm not even going to try and interpret what Hoyd's <laughs> motivations are right now, so that. He's afraid yeah. of something. But, but then her squires are these deserters Mm -hmm. and like a lot of with light weaving, what do they do with it? They hide. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, and and just, so the, the, the voice that this is spoken in feels kind of like that. I don't, I can't say for certain that that's their motivation. It's just something that I've kind of noticed. Well, it's it's the juxtaposition of the two. Mm -hmm. Um, They use illusions. They use lies to keep themselves safe. You contrast mm-hmm. that to the Truth Watchers, which we don't know the full extent of how their light weaving works, but we have been told that they're, they use the light to reveal the truth, mm-hmm. whereas the light weavers use it to conceal the truth. Yeah. Right. And so it's, it's two sides of the same coin. The other thing is they don't swear oaths, they tell truths. So they cloak mm-hmm. themselves in lies because the lies protect you. And so we, mm-hmm. with Shalon, we have that on a very literal level where she has lies built up in her head to protect herself from certain memories that are just too mm-hmm. painful for her. And so, but now you take that with what this sobering truth, we are leaving, they're leaving this place because its protections are failing and the sudden realization of the truth. If we're not safe here, where are we safe? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, I mean, this is their stronghold. Yeah. If you don't have that, then what do you have for so security? Yeah. That's it's a very. It sounds to me like because Shalon also a scholar, that I do think her taking her mix of paranoia with you know, excellent scholarship, that would be the next logical question she would ask. Where whereas Yesno would be bogged down in logistics of everything that's going on and trying to figure out why it happened. Shalon mm-hmm. strikes me as the type who'd be like. Yeah, but um, what about the horrible things? The, the things the, the out there? The scary thing over there? The, yeah. The thing? You know that one? Could we discuss that? <laughs> and then yesterday, be like, oh, well, that's a good point. You know, I'm just somehow unfazed by it. And then it's just like, yeah, but what about it, though? What, is, am I, is no one else terrified here? No one else? Am I taking crazy pills? Is it just me? Yeah. Yep. All right, and then I wanted uh, Jar- to end. Jarasaurus from chat makes another interesting point. Shalon and her relationship with the unmade Sia Anat makes that quote more serious. The one, yes. if we're not safe from the unmade here, that's a very interesting point. I hadn't even thought about it from that angle. Yeah. And then I wanted to. Because it's not just not being safe from the unmade. She's, to a degree, allied with one of the unmade. Well, yeah. She groped in Eldritch Horror. <laughs> No, that that was a different Eldritch Spren, and that had nothing to do with Sia and Not. Wasn't it? <laughs> Come on. Just... No, that wasn't Sia and Not. That was. Uh... That's right. It was. Uh, oh gosh, what's oh, her what's name? Her the Midnight Mother. Yeah, I am so bad. At the the Midnight names. Mother. I can't remember her name. Oh, Looking it up because oh this is going to bother everyone who's yelling at us right now. The name. <laughs> Sorry, Mid- I cannot remember. Night Mother. Come on, Coppermind. Reshafir. Reshafir. Yeah. I love the picture they have for it on the copper mine. It's Dude, all sorts. If of you scary. haven't seen it before, look it up. Just look up Ray Shafir on the copper mine, oh. and there's some artwork there. You're just like, oh, that's horrifying. Anyway, Cthulhu esque. It's great. Cthulhu. If Cthulhu decided to open up a theater troupe. Yeah, yeah, that seems fitting. So I wanted to end with Will Shapers because the next book is gonna be focusing on our potential Will Shapers. Indeed. In Esh and I mm-hmm. and. Uh, Venley. Venley. God, Venley. I suddenly just going to say Veshenai. I'm like, that's not a thing. That's not a name. I just said Eshenai. <laughs> so there were two for the Will Shapers. 
Uh, first one. I returned to the tower to find squabbling children instead of proud knights. This is why I hate this place. I'm going to go chart the hidden undersea caverns of Amia. Find my maps in Akina. First of all, it's just like, well, thanks for putting the maps in the worst place possible. <laughs> but well, also, now we know there are hidden undersea caverns in Amia. <laughs> yeah. But it's a nice way for Brandon to sort of drop that in there. Yeah. But I also love what could we know the will shapers are sort of the most independent of the the various. They're the explorers. Yeah. I thought if and I wasn't to the, to the point color, where I thought I'd be a will shaper. And, to the point where on the back of, I believe it was uh, Words of Radiance, Eshenai is referred to as the explorer. Yeah. You know how each of them is, true, yeah. is referred to as, you know, there's the, the bondsmith, there's the, and she is called the explorer. Mm. And so it's interesting that, uh, but I, I love that it's, part of it is she views all these squabblings as petty. Because mm -hmm. that's it's a very much an adult looking at children. But mm -hmm. at the same time, will shapers don't concern themselves with it. They leave. They don't actually confront the issue. Mm -hmm. And I find that interesting because let's look at Venli. Venli has been trying to avoid her issue as much as she can. Mm -hmm. I am so interested to see how they develop in the next book because their relationship in particular, because they switched places. Because Eshenai was the one who wanted to go out and explore and be on her own. And then she ended up being the member of the council for war form. Mm -hmm. And she was bound by these rules. And she held to them yeah. very, very well. But her original drive was to go out and to explore. Meanwhile, Vinley was a homebody. You know, She didn't want to go out and do anything. And then in the end, she ends up pushing the boundaries and you know breaking the rules and starts playing around with power she shouldn't have been playing with. Yep. And so it's really interesting. They're, they're basically two sides to a different coin. And it, I find it really cool that Brandon originally was going to have the flashbacks be Eshenai's, and then later he wondered if they'd be Vinley's, and then he decided to do both. And that was the right call, mm -hmm. because you have this dichotomy between the two of them. You have this um, almost Janus-esque, where, they again, they're two faces of the same thing. Well, and it's interesting because the second one here, now that we abandon the tower, can I finally admit that I hate this place? Too many rules. Mm -hmm. And it's very much the two sisters do show the two sides of the will shapers. One is a mm -hmm. freedom of movement, not wanting to be tied down. Um, but along with that, there's also a freedom from responsibility, not responsibility. That's the wrong word, but of structure, because mm -hmm. if you're. I think of it in a very sort of, if you're supposed to put it in the positive sense of it, like we did with the Dustbringers earlier, very entrepreneurial in that uh, in that way, mm -hmm. where you view the structure as the thing that's holding you back because it has set up this rigid thing and you're like, I don't want to be inside this rigid thing. I'm going out into the world to discover more, it to froze. find out new things. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, it's... It's almost like the concept of, listen, we don't need all these rules. Just don't be a jerk. Yeah. Period. That, that's it. Just be cool and we'll be fine. You start putting these rules in place and we're getting stuck. And, and so just like, and that seems a very will shaper concept. Mm -hmm. Well, and then on top of it, what, what ultimately gets her to be a will shaper? Because she, she has a, a what timber. Mm -hmm. Which I still don't like that it's not timbre and it, it bugs Tam me. It's it's and it's actually timbre. <laughs> timbre, dang it! That's I knew. See, I'm never gonna say that right. <laughs> it's never gonna be correct. It's going down. Because it's I'm an yelling I. Timber. Uh. <laughs> but yeah, you didn't expect Mr. Worldwide to be quoted here, did you? Anyway, the uh, the thing that's interesting is finally what got her to sit there and work with Timbre is the fact that she finally confronted the fact that she ruined everything. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't trust, but she, I, I love, she's still Venley because at the end of the book, she doesn't trust the humans. And she says that mm -hmm. and, and Tambor, you know, pulses basically an agreement. And she's like, but Esh and I did. 
And it's just this realization. Like, she mm. sounds like she's finally learning the lessons that she should have learned from Esh and I long ago. Uh-huh. And she's finally That's... figuring out how to how to sort of synthesize that into her mm-hmm. own life. Hello? Hey, sorry, sorry, you, 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 you froze you okay, froze again. Cool. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, just, I knew something was wrong because suddenly my Google Doc said connecting. And it's just sort of like whenever your uh your GPS is like recalculating, you're like, no, no, don't recalculate what's going on. <laughs> I know I have to turn in five minutes. No, no, don't do this. Yep. Anyway. But yeah, it's just ah uh, This is such a rich treasure trove of little bits of information that Brandon hid in a place that a lot of people will overlook it. I know some people who won't even read the epigrams, which just blows my mind. Oh, man. Because I feel like that's where you get some of the the best little... Like, I, I won't deny, I read them faster than I probably should, but I, I try to slow myself down when I do it, because I know there's going to be stuff hidden in it, mm-hmm. but it's it's more of a habit of, okay, well, it's just a little thing. I got to move on to the next chapter and see what's going to happen and, and follow the action. And, and that. Well, it's good. The, the way the epigrams work, work is you have this big, beautiful picture. That's a puzzle. That is the story, but you have this one little corner of the epigrams that they don't tend to make a ton of sense by themselves. Mm-hmm. You tend to need to group right. them like we just did here. Yes. And when you're in the middle of, you know, Dalinar, you know, clapped, and you're just like, yeah, but, yeah. But, Could you shut up right now? I, uh, Dalinar just clapped. <laughs> and a little well, busy. And he, out of context, that doesn't sound as epic as it really is. <laughs> well, and the way that he weaves them in, a lot of times they'll show up where what they're saying is pertinent to the story. You know, the main story itself. But it's just like a little nod to it. Mm-hmm. And so you're like, okay, this is relevant. I don't know how. So I'm going to dive into the stuff that I, that I know why it's relevant. Mm-hmm. And then, but that's why they're so great to go back to afterwards and start, f- because a lot of them require the perspective that you get from actually reading the full story before you can start understanding them. Mm-hmm. For example, Mistborn. You know, you see all this stuff, oh, yeah. and suddenly at the very end of the book, you realize, oh, there's this big revelation that changes everything you just read. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. And then sometimes he does ones where it's a random string of ones and zeros and Brandon basically just pens up next to it. It's like, to all the crypto analysts who read my books, here you go. <laughs> and they figured out. Oh, man. Why? Because crowdsourcing works. It really does. Whereas I just looked at it and went, nope, I'm not going to get that. Nope. <laughs> well, and then Jordan listened to the audiobook. <laughs> I swear, it was like half as long as the chapter itself. <laughs> and you just hear him one zero 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 one zero one one zero 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 one zero one zero one zero 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 one zero. I think it was more than just binary. I don't think it was binary. Yeah, I, but it's just, I think it was lots of different. And numbers. then you're, that he's, like, there's a pause. And you're like, oh, he pitched the at four nine twelve two one. He goes, like, oh dear, runs out of breath again. <sighs> Two, four, seven, eight. You're just like. You have to feel so sorry for the Kurt, audio just, people. Could we, could, could we just edit him? Like, can we let him breathe? <laughs> it's always fun reading stories about narrators and the authors that they read for, because mm-hmm. there's just every so often there's a little dispute, and you're like, "You did that on purpose." Was it that oh, like you did that? The one like for J- J.K. Rowling yeah, with Stephen, with Stephen to, Fry, to, right? And to she, Stephen he, Fry he couldn't say a phrase or something. And she put Harry that, pocketed it. That's right. And, and she put it in like the next two books several well, times. Well, what, better than that well, what happened? What happened is that he called her and he said, "Would it be all right if just for the audio book I said Harry put it in his pocket?" And he said, "You hear hear the distinct silence, and then you could hear the smirk in her mouth." And she just said, "No." <laughs> <laughs> And she made sure in every subsequent book to put the phrase Harry pocketed it mm-hmm. as a distinct jab at Stephen Fry because J.K. Rowling has a wicked sense of humor and it's amazing. See, and I just imagined it more Emperor Palpatine style. You want this. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I just imagined her just going, No. <laughs> And just like, and what are you going to do about it? <laughs> Paycheck's too good, isn't uh. it? 
but yeah, anyway, um, so let's move on to our giveaway because we've got a new one coming up. Thanks to our patrons, we are able to hold these giveaways every month and the giveaways are open for everyone and free to enter. For this one, we are giving away a paperback copy of Words of Radiance. Kaboom. You didn't I think it could be it a was... paper copy, did you? Hmm. Yeah, this is um, a doorstop <laughs> slash um, <laughs> blunt weapon. Slash thing you use when you don't have a Kevlar vest. If you want to do workouts, <laughs> there's your weight right there. Just just pump that book. Yeah. Be great. Well, no, the weight's not that bad. Well, I mean, you know, there is a hardback version of this that's even worse. Oh, yeah, so. yeah, but they're kind of slippery. But. but just if you compare the uh, width that way and the width that way, <laughs> there's not as much difference as there should be normally. <laughs> Anyway, Brandon, we the are... first person to ever publish a cube for a book. <laughs> <laughs> Even Tolkien couldn't get away with that. I know. Like Tolkien had to split the Lord of the Rings up they didn't into the, three books. They didn't have the technology yet. If I spit and far, so... it's only because I sit upon the sh- shoulders of giants. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that it will be up for a giveaway in order to enter. Just keep an eye out on our social media. We'll put in an announcement out and let you know how to enter that. Of course, we, as always, we want to give a special thanks to Brandon Sanderson's online store at store.brandonsanderson.com for sending us so many great, awesome goodies to share with our listeners. That's you people. You are the listeners. It's true. You are the (laughs) listeners. Um, We do love hearing from you, so keep on sending in questions. You can ask us about the Cosmere. Drop us your idea for a topic you'd like us to discuss during the show. While you're at it, we would love to hear your feedback about how you think we're doing, as well as any interesting theories you might have about what's going on in the Cosmere. You know, tell us your aluminum foil hat theories. Let us know what you like about the podcast. Let us know what you think we could add to make it even better. Send all of your questions and suggestions in a brief, concise email to Cosmere Studies at gmail.com, and hopefully we'll read it as a part of the show. If you would prefer to send us a physical letter, we do have a a P.O. Box at the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies, P.O. Box 970063, Orem, Utah, 84097. Of course, outside of the podcast, we have our own personal projects. So, Amy, where can we find you? So, I am on Facebook as Coincidence Cosplay and Props. My Twitter is at Coincidence Cosp, because my name is too long. My Instagram is at coincidence underscore cosplay, and my website is www.coincidencecosplay.com. Lots of C's. Um, Anyway, so I I am kind of busy with my children, because everything. But school should be done soon, so that'll be nice. And uh, I'm mostly trying to get all my random projects done, because I'm tired of having a list of like 12 or 13 things that are all trying to happen. But I have most of the things I need to do my D&D rogue so I will <clears throat> hopefully be posting about that soon I got my bracers today and they're really fun and I am trying to finish up Vin as well so that's kind nice. of what I'm doing and I learned the hard way that you need to make sure you sand your plastic before you spray paint it because otherwise it peels right off when you try and clear coat it and it's terrible with my Nazca okay. sword so yeah that's me remember kids and Jordan, sand your plastic you? sand it Sounded good. <laughs> I have no idea how to respond to that. Jordan, where can we find your work? Uh, best place is going to be going to twitch.tv slash splice stream. We have been having a ton of fun with our Amiibo tournaments. We've uh, just launched the Grand Amiibo Ultimate Smash series, or Gauss is uh, I need acronyms to make my life complete in every way, shape, or form. And ones that then tie into the fact that I have a physics degree. Oh, it's just... <laughs> Understand when I made this acronym, I I I just just cooed a little. It was great. I basically did the only little uh, squee you, that you'll hear me make. Um, or you can find me on uh, Twitter at Splice Stream or whatever. But uh, mostly, I just want to get out of the way uh, for Bill because Bill, what what have you been up to? <laughs> well, when I'm not here, I actually now have another podcast with my friend Dylan about board games. It's called The Innkeeper's Table. And right now we have got the first two episodes published. The new episodes will come out on Friday mornings. It's only showing up in a few places at the moment, though, because it has to go through an approval process on a lot of the bigger platforms like uh, Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts and all those big ones. Um 
but we're hoping that that will happen soon for most of them. But we are on Spotify, so go ahead and listen to us there, or you can check out our Instagram page at Innkeepers Table Podcast. There's a direct link on the profile over there to the audio files, and you can listen to it that way as well. I've also got a bunch of board game reviews over at www.innkeeperstable.com, and I post about games on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram under the profile name at Innkeepers Table. Um, for those of you who do want to support the Sandersonian Institute of Cosmere Studies podcast, but you can't become patrons just yet for whatever reason, we would love it if you just let your friends know about the show. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast and to like and subscribe over on youtube.com slash Cosmere Studies. All right, final thoughts, guys. Anything about the the gemstone archive that stood out to you? Brandon has explicitly stated this is not the eponymous Stormlight Archive. People have asked him that <laughs> multiple times, and he's just like, no, this is not. The Stormlight Archive is the collection of books that share the titles this with is, the this series. This is the gemstone and it's, archive. And it's, a, it's not an actual archive of books. It's, it's uh, the spirit of an archive. <laughs> But no, I, I was just mostly but, surprised at how how many little things came out of so few lines. Right? Yeah. It's crazy. It's almost like uh, we could talk about anything for too long. <laughs> it's true. I don't know. Could we? Hmm. Hey, we've, we've done it before. Yes. And that's why they keep coming back, though, because y'all are as crazy interested in this as we are, I feel <laughs> like. And that's the, the great thing about being a fan of the Cosmere. Is we're all a little bit nuts. <laughs> In a good way, of course. Definitely. Of uh, course. My last thought. Uh, I was very interested in the technology for this. Just the idea of playing with uh, the frequency of a of a crystal. And does mm-hmm. that technically make the these things glass drives? What? Glass Instead of flash drives. drive? Glass drive? Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It, it, it needed to be explained. I'm sorry, I can't give you That's that. That's your one. fault. The joke was was crystal, clear as crystal. Get out. I mean, at this point, <laughs> you're no longer welcome here. <laughs> Can I still come upside? I'll still need my drive to to actually give you your audio stuff. <laughs> In addition to the live episodes of the show that stream on twitch.tv slash innkeepers table every two weeks on Monday nights at 7:30 p.m. Pacific time, 10:30 p.m. Eastern. Listeners can find our videos on YouTube or audio versions of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and just about any other service that carries podcasts by searching for Cosmere Studies. You can also follow us and contact us through Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under the profile at Cosmere Studies. For our next episode, we're going to be going through even more of the epigrams from the Stormlight Archive as we discuss the listeners' songs. So make sure to be here live on twitch.tv slash innkeepers table in two weeks on June 1st, 2020 at 7.30 p.m. Pacific Time, 10.30 p.m. Eastern. Until then, on behalf of Amy, Jordan, and myself, thanks for listening, and remember, there's 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 always always another secret. secret. Nowhere else.